right, this is Ronan Hart with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program on the Underground Railroad Project uh, in partnership with the National Park Service. Um, we are in Cincinnati. It is June 30th, 2023, uh, about 10 a.m. Uh, and I am joined by Barry Jurgensen, National Park Service. Gabrielle Hurd. El Alves. And who do I have the pleasure of speaking with today? Yes, my name is uh, Derek Still Mays. Um, I am from Vineland, New Jersey. I was born there in 1961. Mm -hmm. For the record, could you just spell out your first, last, and middle name? Derek, D-E-R-R-I-C-K, Still, S-T-I-L-L, -L -L, Mays, M-A-Y-E-S. Oh, perfect. So you were you were just trying to say uh, where and when you were born, which was my next question. Uh, you were born in Cincinnati. No, I was born or, in Vineland, New Jersey. Vineland. Okay, I misheard you. Um, okay, uh, where were your parents from? Um, my parents were from uh, Vineland, New Jersey, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So Philadelphia, obviously, that's um, where uh, William still did most of what he was involved in. Um, was that something that was discussed growing up at all, your, your relationship to the stills? Uh, yes, pretty much. My mother was the still, that's why my last name is Mays. Mm -hmm. uh, so her father, Joseph Still, uh, was born in Lawnside, New Jersey, and then moved to Atlantic City, New Jersey, and then moved to Vineland, and that's where I was born. Mm -hmm. So in, from, your, from your mother was, um, William Still and the Underground Railroad, was that talked about a lot? You know, in, in what way was it talked about, if it was? Okay. Uh, yeah, as a, as a child, uh, probably best I can remember, 10 years old, um, the story was told uh, to most of the children. Uh, and then also the family had a regular family reunion mm -hmm. uh, that we held in Lawnside, which still uh, goes on today. I think it's at 154. Uh, with three years off because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So hearing these stories as a kid, was it something you took a lot of interest in when you were younger? Uh, I don't think so as I uh, was younger, but I think it kind of hit me when I got to college and you know, history was uh, more uh, prevalent to um, me versus as a child. Uh, no, it wasn't really. We, I mean, went to the family reunions, met family, but mm -hmm. it wasn't you know, too important at that time, I mm -hmm. don't think. Tell me more about the, the family reunions. How many people did you say were coming to these? Uh, it's been, it varied between 600 to, wow. um, you know, sometimes on light years at 200. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, William Still and the Underground Railroad were talked about a lot there. Were there, do you have family members who are really into the genealogy or the history of it? Yeah, uh, as, the, as the young folks got older, they recognized how important the history was. And so, uh, yeah, it, it's pretty uh, well designed to make sure when uh, we attend the family reunion, uh, things uh, that we carried along, books and uh, materials were always bought to the family reunion. We did skits and other things around the story. Uh, and uh, what we're doing now is trying to expand uh, the conversation outside of just William and Peter, mm -hmm. because um, those two still members uh, came around in about 1950, I mean, 1950, 1850, yeah. uh, and there were stills who uh, participated in the Ground Railroad prior to that, uh, that we're, we're finding more about. Okay. Well, do you want to take me back to that history and talk about the, the still family like you just mentioned? Yeah. Well, I can, I can start off with uh, my grandfather, Joseph Still, mm -hmm. Sr., uh, as I mentioned, uh, was uh, born in Lawnside. Uh, his father's uh, name was Daniel Still, and his grandfather's name was David Still. Uh, David Still was a reverend uh, in the AME church, and um, Lawnside, uh, which most people may or may not know, uh, was initially known as Freehaven. Mm -hmm. And Freehaven was a sign that in fugitives and um, uh, former slaves knew that this was a place that they could go to uh, and um, find safety. Uh, so the Still family uh, worked in churches uh, primarily uh, to promote um, the history of the Underground Railroad, um, and the family unions were just a part of, of that whole 
piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to tell me maybe specifically about uh, William and Peter Still? Um, what you know about them, where they were born, uh, how they came to have this role in the Underground Railroad? Okay. Uh, yeah, Peter was actually born in Maryland, uh, um, Caroline County. Uh, William was born in New Jersey. So Peter was the second oldest child and William was the youngest. So they're pretty far apart. Uh, Peter was born in slavery. William uh, was born free in New Jersey. Um, Peter was enslaved uh, for approximately 40 years before he was able to uh, secure his freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and then William, of course, uh, around 1847, he moved to Philadelphia and started working for the Anti-Slavery Society. And so part of that um, work was uh, keeping track of fugitives who came through Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, also, Peter um, finally was able to secure his freedom and the freedom of his family uh, in about 1850. Um, but what most people don't know is that around 1803, the Methodist Church uh, in Lawnside um, was instrumental in the Underground Railroad. Uh, those uh, Methodist uh, ministers, the Quakers, um, actually held church in Lawnside combined with the African-American community. Somewhere around 1813, uh, the African-American uh, uh, community and the uh, Quaker community stopped uh, having service together. And that's when uh, Richard Allen, uh, who started the AME Church, um, became uh, a part of uh, the Underground Railroad in Lawnside. So are there any particular stories about uh, William Still or Peter Still that you find particularly impressive or the first time you read about it either as a kid or as you got older, it's, it was just like, wow, you know, this is someone I'm descended from who did these amazing things. Does anything spring to mind? Oh yeah, certainly. The, 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 the time when um, Peter um, came to Philadelphia for his first time and sat in the Philadelphia uh, Abolitionist Society office and uh, sat down and, and at the time he didn't know who William was, mm -hmm. but met him for the first time and found out that that was his brother. Uh, my cousin uh, Gloria Still, who used to be uh, what we call the family griot, she always used to tell this story uh, uh, that they told Peter and Levin why they were uh, in Maryland, um, Hap you find a white man you could trust, tell him you got stole from Philadelphia. So that story resonated with Peter all of his life. And so when he had the opportunity to become free, mm -hmm. uh, he went to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And then I guess some people may know that um, part of that trip, uh, and this is the part that kind of uh, kind of gets to me, part of that trip came through Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. So when I moved to, uh, to Cincinnati at 18, and um, it just was, you know, this was the place that he came through. There were two um, Jewish uh, brothers, the Friedman brothers, who uh, attended Wise Temple down, downtown Cincinnati, uh, who also had a store in Tusculum, uh, Alabama, and uh, were willing to purchase Peter um, for $500 and then uh, give him his manumission papers and that happened right here in Cincinnati. Wow. So, you know, that story is, is you know, gets you right in the throat, gets me right in the throat. Yeah, absolutely, his brother. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you already mentioned that William Still was working for the Anti-Slavery Society in Philadelphia. Can you say any more about what that work looked like, how exactly he contributed to this cause? Yes. Um, but before I, I share that, I, I want to share that there were two... Uh, vigilance committees, mm. and those vigilance committees had agents. William Still was the agent on the vigilance committee um, around, again, about 1850. Uh, he learned what he did from a gentleman uh, named Jacob C. White. Uh, Jacob C. White was a prominent uh, African-American in Philadelphia who was the agent of um, the first vigilance committee. So William Still oversaw the second vigilance committee 
and he learned from um, Jacob uh, C. Uh, White uh, regarding the uh, Vigilance Committee. Uh, so his work really was networking, and uh, he used his family as a big part of that, uh, especially in New Jersey, because um, those small towns were places where the fugitives were most safe. Um, so we're talking about uh, Mount Holly, New Jersey. We're talking about Greenwich and Salem, New Jersey. We're talking about, of course, Lawnside, New Jersey, Haddonfield. So all these were small communities in New Jersey where William Steele was networking mm -hmm. to uh, help uh, fugitives, uh, including Harriet Tubman. Wow. Yeah. I, that networking point is really interesting to me because I love looking at the Underground Railroad as kind of a model for like social activism and organizing. Do you see those kind of strands of that activism and organizing that was happening through the stills and the Underground Railroad, kind of through your family, um, maybe to more recent times in terms of being involved in your community, taking that same ethos of community and trying to make a difference? Is that something that's still prevalent in your family, you would say? Yeah, I think that uh, certainly carried over. Uh, the city of Lawnside, uh, again, it was known as Freehaven, and also uh, it also was known as Snow Hill, mm -hmm. which is a city in Maryland, um, was one of the first um, uh, African-American-run uh, uh, cities above the Mason-Dixon line. Mm -hmm. uh, and wow. so uh, it, it required uh, those individuals to set up governments, you know, and, and things of that nature. and. Um, it really helped uh, people understand how important it was uh, for them to be involved in the community. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is a, a case where um, William still uh, wrote a letter uh, in regard to streetcars. And so that letter uh, was to de desegregate streetcars in Philadelphia, similar to what happened in Alabama uh, years after with the yeah. buses. A yeah, hundred years after. Yeah, a hundred yeah. years after, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so there, there's a, uh, uh, I can't remember what the document is called, but if someone looked it up, they, they'd find where William still wrote a letter to the, to the Pennsylvania uh, uh, legislature, legislature uh, requesting that streetcars uh, be desegregated. Because what they, if you were an African American, you had to ride on the outside of the, of the streetcar. You couldn't get on. Uh, with the uh, other patrons on in if it was raining or muddy or whatever mm -hmm. uh, yeah so there's 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 numerous other cases I'll give you an example of my of my more recent my not that recent but in the 1940s my grandfather um, actually um, filed a complaint against um, a liquor establishment uh, because they weren't uh, allowing African Americans to uh, come in and buy, mm -hmm. uh, and that happened in, in New Jersey in about in the 1940s. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I think um, the family still is, is pretty involved with uh, community activism, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in Longstein. Longstein still is a, a predominantly African-American community. Uh, it's prominent in the activities in Camden County. Uh, so uh, yeah, the family is, is still involved in, in activism, certainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to go back a little bit to um, when you were younger and hearing about uh, your family and the Underground Railroad, that as opposed to maybe what you were learning in school about the Underground Railroad, if you were learning about it at all, was there, you know, what was that like having this background that you get from your family versus the version of it that came in school? Is it something that um, you, you talk to teachers or talk to fellow students about these things that you knew that maybe other people didn't? Um, no, not, not in my era. Uh, school didn't really talk about this subject too, too much. It was pretty small mm -hmm. uh, in nature in the history book. Uh, but, you know, family members, uh, brothers and sisters, cousins, uh, we all were very, you know, prideful of, yeah. of what, the, what we had done or what the family had done. Uh, my mother um, had 12 brothers and sisters, so I had a lot of cousins. And so all the cousins were certainly proud of uh, what, you know, the history of the family was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so kind of similar to my question about um, social activism, also religion and faith clearly was a huge motivator for abolitionists and people on the Underground Railroad. Is that something that you also see as a through line through your family um, in terms of 
that community involvement being rooted in in the church, like you mentioned, the, the AME church, um, in, in terms of trying to make a difference in your community or just personal motivation. What's What would you say is the role of faith in this? Yeah, uh, the, the role of faith, uh, spirituality, religion, uh, is paramount in the Still family uh, mm -hmm. from, from day one. Uh, so as far as you can go back and the Stills have a uh, record of it, you know, uh, spirituality, religion, faith, God is a part of it and it's a part of it today. So I don't think um, uh, we would be here without that today. Yeah. And especially with the Underground Railroad, um, the AME Church and the ME Church and the Quakers mm -hmm. were instrumental in um, saving and, and helping fugitives escape. Uh, it, it always wasn't documented, especially in the early uh, 1800s. Uh, and those documents are now becoming available because of digitizing and things of that nature. Uh, so uh, it's, the records are there in some cases, but uh, it certainly happened and communities and, and people work together to, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know you have that, the, the religious kind of side of it and the social activism side. Something that I found really interesting reading about still a little bit was his success in business that also came in his life in Philadelphia and being able to like own land as as an African American in this period. What do you think that says about about William Still, about maybe the ethos of the Still family, that kind of business success that they were able to achieve at the same time? Um, well, I, again, I think everything uh, really started with uh, religion mm -hmm. and the church was instrumental in uh, helping um, family members do business because the church was really where everything happened. Uh, the school was at the church. Uh, all the church members helped individuals build their homes, their businesses. So it's still uh, the business in Philadelphia um, was, a, was a city business, but a lot of the business that we don't uh, know about were businesses in, in the country and in the community. Example, uh, Dr. James Still was a physician, but he couldn't get a license mm -hmm. uh, because they wouldn't allow him. But it, still in all, he treated people, and those people that he treated weren't in Philadelphia. They were in the local communities. Uh, so the businesses were always a part of it. Um, um, it's just that William happened to be able to do that in uh, Philadelphia, which is more documented. Mm -hmm. I see. That's, it's such an impressive history that like every aspect of this. You mentioned a family member, Gloria Still. You called a, the family Griot. That's like a storyteller. That's right? correct. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about her? Uh, yeah. <sighs> well, it, it's, it's tough because uh, she, she's, she's deceased now. Mm -hmm. So um, um, she, was, she was the person who, who um, went out and did things like this. He, she talked to the community. She shared the stories. She did the research. Um, and she just wanted to make sure that the family story stayed alive. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one thing she always said, because uh, her name is uh, Gloria Tuggle Still. Mm -hmm. So she was uh, married into the Still family, but she always said, I'm a Still because I pushed out a whole lot of Stills. <laughs> <laughs> and that was her, her little motto when yeah. they said, well, you're not really a Still. You're, no, no, I pushed out some Stills, yeah. so I'm, I'm still a Still. <laughs> still a Still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so Gloria was, was amazing, and uh, mm -hmm. we miss her dearly. Yeah, yeah. Is, so e even with her uh, gone now, is there, has someone kind of stepped into that role as the, the storyteller who brings things into the community in that way? Uh, not as much as it was with, with her. We're, we're really working on that. Uh, we're trying to involve younger people uh, in the family to kind of take that role. So it, it's, it's not... No one has stepped up to, to the level that she's at, but yeah. we have some young people that are, are moving in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I, I read um, that you, I believe you started the William Still Underground Railroad Foundation. Correct. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Could you tell me about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, I think 20-some uh, years ago, uh, when I had less gray hairs, uh, I, I, I thought that there needed to be uh, some structure uh, to what we were doing, mm -hmm. uh, and typically structure requires uh, an entity to to move things along. So um, me and some cousins decided we would uh, create the foundation. 
Uh, and uh, in creation of the foundation, we, we began to be able to tell the story um, a little broader uh, from the perspective um, that uh, we were able to connect with other families, uh, and that was really important to us. We actually, um, very ironically, we uh, held an event 20 years ago today. Uh, it was called the National Underground Railroad Family Reunion Festival, and it was in Philadelphia. And so we invited families from other Underground Railroad uh, uh, stories to Philadelphia for this event that happened over three days. And so we invited the uh, families from Canada, from Maryland, from California, all to this one place to meet each other. Um, Frederick Douglass family was there, Harry Tubman's family was there, um, uh, just, a, just a host of families were, were there. That's uh, incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I hadn't heard of that yeah. event before. Can you say any more about, you know, what happens when you get all of those people in, in one place and get to talking? What, what was that experience like? Oh, the energy was amazing. It was, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, people just hugging and thanking and just, uh, just mm -hmm. really just appreciative uh, that they get to meet other folks who families had contributed to uh, the cause. Uh, Thomas Garrett's family was there, so it was was quite a quite a few families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you got to talking to people from other underground railroad descended families, did you find a lot of similarities in terms of when people talk about their parents or how they were raised or the way they saw the world? Were were there like patterns or similarities that you saw? Yeah, I, I think there were, but there also were differences because. Um, their backgrounds, where they were raised, who they were raised by, uh, made things different. But in most cases, uh, uh, spirituality was was very important to most of them, uh, along with uh, just the desire to be free. Mm -hmm. And and those families were just as appreciative as as we are of our ancestors being in the forefront of having that happen. Yeah. Is there anything else you can say about the foundation um, in terms of Maybe other than that event, what, what kinds of work has it done? What's been its impact? Well, what, what, we, what we did from that was we needed to do more research. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's where our focus is, is on the research. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, digitizing documents in courthouses. So the research is more available now uh, than it ever has been before. So an example is the, the folks down at Caroline County Historical Society they were able to get into the Maryland archives and find information that, um, you know, without that expertise that they had, that information would still be in the courthouse. So we, we, we want to connect with people who are doing the research uh, and help them make sure uh, they have all the information from the family mm. to assist them uh, with their research. Oh, that, that's, that is really important. That was going to kind of be my next question is who is, doing this research, is this like family members, cousins of yours, you, um, or is that more, more you guys taking that facilitating role, helping out other people or scholars who are involved in that? Right. A little bit of both. We're doing our own research, uh, but at the same time, we're working with people who uh, have founded a, a passion to do the research as well. Again, Research is, is kind of specialized, especially yeah. when you're talking about going into the archives. You got to know where you're looking and, and things of that nature. So uh, mm -hmm. and then younger people are, uh, are are important, too, because they have that that knowledge of uh, uh, electronics and the computers and, yeah. and things in the searches. And so um, that that helps, too. I, you said earlier that you saw some members of the younger generation taking an interest in this. What? Do you, do you have an idea of like why they're particularly interested in, in this history? Yeah, well, so when I said younger, uh, I probably meant okay. 30 to 40. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not 20 to 25. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have, uh, I have two children. Uh, both, uh, both are in school. Well, one just graduated and one's still in school, mm -hmm. in, in law school. So even with them, they, they know the history but they haven't engaged it as I would maybe have want them to, but I know they're in school and they're doing yeah. that. So when they free themselves yeah. of that obligation, uh, then I would expect that they would um, 
be be directly involved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So William Still definitely is one of the better, best known of people who are involved in the Underground Railroad. How do you think there's been a good job commemorating him and his family and his legacy um, in terms of in Philadelphia, in historical markers, in, um, in in culture? Is there anything that you think is missing or things that should be commemorated that aren't even like buildings or, or churches or sites that, that should be commemorated in your mind? Um, well. 20 years ago, or 25 years ago, I would be saying, no, people didn't even know who William Steele was at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and from 25 years ago, I'd say uh, a lot has uh, happened, and his name is more uh, relevant and known yeah. in, 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 in the sphere of historians and people that uh, know history, but still, for general people, William Steele is not a name that jumps out at them. Okay. And, and the family doesn't necessarily need his name to be, you know, uh, a household name in a sense. Mm-hmm. But if the story of the Underground Railroad would, would be part of the conversation, then we would hope that he would uh, be part of it, uh, of that conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Frederick Douglass, Harry Tubman, they are, they are household names. Yeah. And people know those names. But if people say William Still, that's, that doesn't say the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it did, but I'm just in, <laughs> into history, I guess. I, I might be have a tilted perspective. Yeah. Um, it, well, even maybe even if not still, it does seem like there is a kind of increasing interest in the Underground Railroad, uh, at least a little bit. Do you think there's any kind of any reason for that or any like modern resonance with this period of history and um, these freedom seekers and underground railroad conductors today. And, you know, even if people aren't as interested in it as they should be, any reason that you think more people really need to get this message? Uh, Yeah, I I really do uh, think that more people need to get this message because uh, the message is really about um, people and relationships. Yeah. Okay, and being connected. And so if we don't use the word Underground Railroad at all, we can use the word relationships, Mm -hmm. connections and cooperation and all those things. And that's really what the Underground Railroad was, because without that, uh, those individuals seeking freedom would not have ever, ever, ever made it. And then we know in, in today's world, that's so important where we talk with people, connect with people, understand. And so that's what the Underground Railroad was. It was a connection. And so one of the terms we coined uh, years ago uh, was still connected. Uh, The family and and we wanted, and that's the part of the reason that we did the reunion. uh, We wanted us to be connected with all the families and all the families to benefit from what their families had contributed Mm -hmm. versus just the still family benefiting. That's wonderful. That's, I like that still connected. Barry or uh, Gabrielle, Helio, do any of you have any, any questions that spring to mind? I, I pretty much covered the um, ones I had before. I, I was just wondering if you had any other stories of e- either William or Peter Steele that kind of stand out as great examples of resistance to enslavement via the Underground Railroad or anything, any other stories that pop into mind? Um. Well, I, I, I guess the story that's, that it's, it's written, but I can share it with you. Uh, it's in, in this book, Kidnapped in the Ransom. And um, it's really a story about how uh, people uh, who were uh, in a position to help try to even at the peril of their life. Uh, so Peter, uh, in uh, his quest to bring his family to freedom, uh, came through Cincinnati on his way back down south um, with a with a gentleman who lost his life in trying to save uh, Peter's family. So um, those stories are important because any time um, people lose their life in effort to save others is important and they should be highlighted. So so that story is is pretty pretty important. Um, and then I, I guess um, the story of of Peter 
and uh, the connection uh, with uh, the Friedman family, the local family here uh, that um, uh, it, it, it never happened, but we were hoping that it would happen. We were trying to connect the Still family with the, with the Friedman family, uh, again, to just thank them for what they did uh, with Peter. Um, here in Cincinnati? Yeah, here in Cincinnati. Wow. They, they are not here, but uh, their descendants are here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, can't remember the lady's name who helped us track the family down, um, uh, but we never we never were able to get the family together. Uh. Was slavery uh, thinking about your childhood? Was slavery or even the Underground Railroad something that your family discussed or talked about with you? Uh, yeah, we we talked about it. Uh, we discussed it. Um, it was just more of a, a topic of sharing information of what the family had contributed. Uh, it wasn't, you know, how, how bad slavery was or mm -hmm. the situation in slavery. It really wasn't about the negative parts of slavery. It was really about um, what the family had contributed to uh, uh, assisting fugitives uh, coming through the Underground Railroad. Yeah. One thing that you said that was has stuck out to me was about you and, and siblings or cousins who felt a real sense of pride, and of course rightfully so, having this heritage and having these, um, these ancestors who, who did all of these amazing things. Is there any way that you think that sense of pride can be in, instilled or brought about in from the education system for even people who maybe don't have that same kind of legacy in their heritage um, for African-American children whose history is usually just kind of pushed to the side or not acknowledged as something special. You know, how can maybe the lessons of the Underground Railroad or those stories in your family be used to create that sense of pride for more young people? Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we coined the term still connected. Mm -hmm. Still connected uh, really is a way for those individuals or families that can't show how they were actually involved. But we really know that um, all the families that were uh, enslaved Mm -hmm. had individuals in their family who escaped. We yeah. just don't know who they are. Yeah. So the, the connection is still connected. We are connected with those families as well as the families that are recognized. Mm -hmm. And so that's the story we have to tell to young people are that they may not know how their family was connected uh, to uh, the story of freedom, but they are connected. They are really still connected. Mm -hmm. And so we have to really just dig down in a little bit more and explain to them, you know, the records may not show, but the reality is that they really were Absolutely. a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, that's pretty much all of the questions I have. I don't, yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So I, I, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more. We were, we were talking about Peter Stills, um, rescue of his family. Could you elaborate more on that story? I know, an abolitionist that was helping them um, died in the process. Um, could you elaborate more? Was it successful or was it a, what yeah. happened there? Yeah, it, it wasn't successful. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, Peters family still remained in slavery uh, for a few years later uh, until uh, Peter actually um, was assisted uh, raising the funds to actually secure the family's freedom. So what, what Peter actually did with the help of uh, a number of, uh, of folks uh, was uh, go around to talk and, and become a speaker and raise money. Uh, and then he was able to secure the uh, freedom of, uh, of, uh, of his family. There's actually documents. Uh, Rutgers have archives of uh, letters that kind of talk about uh, how that all took place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
how did you came about all this information and how would you like to see your family's legacy preserved? Um, well, uh, how I came about this information, I guess it, it's a couple ways. One, um, the family had already begun uh, keeping track of it. Uh, two, uh, great people have done some great research and provided uh, resources to the information that would add and include. Uh, and then we've done our own work on our own to try to um, put you know, things together ourselves through oral history conversations. Um, and uh, so that's kind of how we, we were able to do it, a compilation of, of people and work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, how would you like to see your family's, your family's legacy preserved? Um, I, I think the most important thing is um, the history of the Underground Railroad, again, was around cooperation. So I think the legacy for the Still family is around cooperation and how people can work together to get things done. Right. Okay. Um, we see uh, you have some like documents, uh, pictures. Would you like to show us some of them? Sure. 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 Just hold it up in front of you for the camera. Okay. And talk about them. Okay. So this first. Uh, artifact is a second edition Underground Railroad uh, book that William still published uh, initially in 1872, but this is a second edition. Do you know what year this, this edition is from? Uh, I think it was 1870. Uh, I don't know the exact year, yeah. so I don't know. 1870s. Yes, 1870s, yeah. yeah so. so is it just sort of biographical stories or talking about other nodes on the Underground Railroad? Well, uh, this book here is, is, is re was reprinted in uh, 1970 by Ebony. And so, so it's the version you open. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's all, all the narratives and the records that William still kept and put into a book. Mm -hmm. So this is the 1970 version of the Underground Railroad. Yeah. Um, this book here is Kidnapped and Ransom which is the story of Peter Still mm -hmm. and his uh, adventures uh, after uh, he was able to uh, buy his freedom from the Freedman Brothers mm -hmm. here in Cincinnati. So this is his story and their story. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a National Geographic magazine of when uh, National Geographic's came to a Still family reunion. Um, wow. I don't have my glasses on. I can't remember what year it was, but uh, maybe you all can. Uh, 84. 84. So in 1984, National Geographic came to uh, our family reunion. Oh, that's beautiful. Are you in this, this photo? I am not. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, 84, I was here in Cincinnati in school. Oh, okay, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but my grandfather is right here and many cousins. And, that's wonderful. Yeah. So, uh, so this book here is a book of uh, the families in Cincinnati of Jewish descent. Mm -hmm. Why I have a copy of it is I had the page picked out. Okay, well, I, I made a copy of it. There's a page in the book that talks about Peter Steele in, in this book. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to the main content of the book. Well, the Freedman Brothers were Jewish. Oh, okay. And they were from Cincinnati. So they're, they're in the book. Mm -hmm. It talks about their um, temple that they stayed at, Wise Temple, which was a temple downtown Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. So the book talks about Peter Still in this uh, Jewish history book. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, 
This here was the program from the 20 year ago still connected uh, Fan Reunion Festival. Were there descendants of um, John Brown? Yes. Descendants? Oh, yes. that's amazing. Yep. John Brown's people were there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so and then, well, that's me many years ago. And this was the congressional record that they oh. provided for that event. Excellent. Um, and then many states um, had proclamations from Delaware, Pennsylvania, oh, Jersey. Excellent. Are there any plans to do something similar to this yeah, we, again? Yeah, we, we, we are working on it. Um, we would love to include people. We just have to figure out how to get it done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give us an invite. I think we'd love to do some interviews there. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this this photo behind you or this illustration? Yeah, that's is Peter. The same. Peter still. That's in. He's in the. He's right here. Oh yeah. That's the same image. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. One one thing that occurred to me is um, doing these interviews this last week and talking to people about the way that they they've learned about their own family from these uh, books published by kind of unrelated people in academia is that they they appreciate them and that they've learned a lot from them, but sometimes the things are missing or people don't like the approach that the author took in some way. Um, do you have any? Don't don't need to say any names, obviously. But is there is there anything about the kind of academic approach around um, William and Peter Still that you think could be different or could be added on? Well, um, we we think what the academia does is great um, mm -hmm. because without it, a lot of the information would never be uh, unearthed, mm -hmm. uh, and we really can't. If we can't sit with them while they do it, we really we really shouldn't be too too upset. Yeah. But we should at least share with them what we think uh, it may should look like. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. So you know, uh, uh, an example, and this may sound strange. Um, the family also thinks that the history of the Still family and the Underground Railroad doesn't really tell the full story of how the, the whole family, right now we talk about Peter and William, but there were Edward and all these other Still family members that mm -hmm. were left out. So we want the total story to be told, and I think other families would also want their full family uh, story told. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're going to help, you know, as much as we can to shed light on uh, the city of Lawnside and how it played a role in the Underground Railroad. People know about Peter Mott, Peter Mott House, uh, but they don't recognize that Peter Mott uh, was a superintendent at the church, uh, the AME church in Lawnside. So he, at night, helped fugitives in the day he was uh, basically a elder or a pastor at, at the church. Mm -hmm. Well, if you just think about that, if he was an elder and a pastor at the church, then he knew everybody, right? And that helped him be able to do what he did. Uh, and so we need to make sure we understand it wasn't really just Peter Mott, it wasn't just really William Still, it was the whole community working on these Underground Railroad uh, stories and projects. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that's what I think we should kind of recognize. Instead of the, the face is always the most important. I think we yeah. should recognize. Uh, and, and families that don't know um, feel left out as well. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think, and that includes, that, that, that's inclusiveness to make sure that um, all the folks at the Underground Railroad get, get some credit for what they contributed. Mm -hmm. It was a community that may happen, and now it really seems like it's a community of people who are bringing the story forward and who are involved in this. Um, I think that's I think that's wonderful. Um, do you have anything else that you want to show us? Um, um, any other? Uh, I had a lot of stuff, but I didn't want to bring it all over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I guess I guess that that's it. Um, 
Yeah, that's that's, that's probably. Well, it. do you have do you have any concluding thoughts or anything else that you want to um, just put on the record and have out there? Yeah, I just want to thank you all for allowing me to share. Uh, I think the work that you're doing, of course, is, is great work. Um, uh, uh, and if I can do anything to help, it, you know that I, I'm I'm here. Um, uh, and that's that that's it I think okay thank well thank you yeah thank you for sharing your story yeah. and all of this okay. wonderful <laughs>